I think as you know, or many of you know, uh, last Friday I started uh, a lecture series uh, in Beijing at the Renmin University on the Karma Doctrine of Buddhism. And it's going to be a, a long course until the, towards the latter part of December. Uh, yesterday I started talking, uh, starting from a lecture one on the Karma Doctrine in early Buddhism. Uh, this time, of course, I will, I'm only able to do one lecture uh, from the perspective of early Buddhism. I wish to do more. Uh, in fact, uh, there have been some requests for me. I think there's a lot of interest for people in China to want to learn about early Buddhism. It's just that I can't find the time because I have to cover so many things. So in the course of this lecture, and uh, usually I try to start uh, from the historical perspective, uh, starting with early Buddhism. And this time, I was able to fit in one lecture, whole lecture on it. Uh, for a three-hour lecture, many things were covered on Kama, so I can't uh, repeat everything now. And I just want to share one uh, point I made there. This is about the Karma theory, that uh, the Karma theory of the Buddha uh, is not just a continuation or just a, a taking over from the Indian tradition or Indian religions in the Buddha's time. The Buddha in the suttas uh, clearly uh, described the different doctrines of other schools like the uh, Jainis, uh, the Jainism, Jainas, uh, the Ajivikas, mm, and so on, and show that uh, his understanding, his teaching of the of, of the talking of the Buddha was different, and uh, we can say that uh, we can summarize that uh, the differences are on account of some important principles in the Buddha's teaching. First is that the Buddha's teachings is a form of non-theism. The Buddha did not accept, did not believe in a creator God. In fact, although there are many forms of Buddhism now, Theravada, Mahayana, Tantrayana, and uh, even in Mahayana in Chinese Buddhism, there are so many different sects, but no sect will accept a creator God. Now, this is a very important point. And no sect, <coughs> more, more, more importantly, will accept, no Buddhist sect will accept the idea of a divine eternal soul destined by God. There's no Atma. Yeah. So these are important uh, doctrines. And uh, thirdly, because uh, the Buddha explained that his doctrines are based on his direct insight into the working of karma. In other words, it's not a matter of uh, of philosophical speculation, so-called, uh, in Western terms. So I never like to talk about uh, the Buddha's teaching as philosophy in the Western sense. Sometimes we use the term, but I have to qualify it. Uh, because of these few principles, the Buddha's doctrines are unique. Buddha's doctrines on karma are unique and uh, distinguished from the doctrines of the other schools. So as I said, I discussed many, many differences and uh, trying to show the distinctive features of uh, the Buddha, uh, the Buddha's uh, karma doctrine, and uh, there is no time to repeat everything. So there's only one point I want to say today in the brief uh, session of sharing, and that is uh, the point that the Buddha's teaching of uh, Kamma uh, conforms to the middle way 
and definitely it is not a form of fatalism, not a form of determinism. That is very, very important. That is, um, you know, in uh, like Jainism and the other forms of, uh, of the uh, heretical teachings, and outside teachings, in the Buddha's time and also uh, now in the world, uh, there is the uh, belief, there is the doctrine that uh, our life is determined fully and there is no freedom. And uh, in terms of karma, once you have done a karma or karma, uh, then uh, you are helpless. You can't do anything. To, to, to author anything. So that, that's what we call fatalism or determinism. This is not the Buddha's doctrine of karma. Uh, there is the uh, deterministic aspect, there is also the aspect of freedom, the aspect of change. So in that sense, it is a middle way doctrine. It's very, very important to understand that. Otherwise, people think. You know, uh, you know, usually we say we, we, our experiences are all because of past karma or, you know, then we, we lament that we can't do anything about it. Uh, well, it's true actually to, to quite a large extent, the way we are, the way we feel, the way we respond to things, even the way we think, we conceptualize, and all this are due to our past conditioning. And the current condition is very, very strong. And in fact, uh, it causes still a hindrance. And, and I, I hope to elaborate on this in my public talk in January, early January, on karma in, in Hong Kong. Um, that we have to understand. So it's very important to understand a, a different human being. We are all different, you know. Even you speak in terms of genetic differences, psychological differences, but you have to remember that in Buddhist, if you like, uh, uh, even psychology, Buddhist philosophy, so-called, there is the samsaric perspective, which you don't find in modern systems. That's a big fundamental difference. I've said that, for instance, uh, however similar some of the <coughs> explanations in modern psychology and philosophy, are compared to the Buddhist teaching, Buddha's teaching, uh, they never go further than you know your the, the, the experiences uh, from childhood. So I'm particularly referring to psychology and psychotherapy. You see, so usually they say you have these experiences, you you react like this, you perceived like this because of your childhood experiences. It become a big, very big thing for them. But Buddhism go far beyond that. Huh? Uh, to understand the human, particularly human's problem, a person's problem. Firstly, you understand that it's not just his problem. It's a problem of related to his family, related to his whole species, whole society, and even to humanity to the collective karma. But that's already one aspect that you don't find in most form of uh, modern psychology, except perhaps you can say in Jungian psychology. C.G. Jung, he speaks of the collective unconscious and we know that, that that conception of the collective unconscious that contributes to a particular individual's you know, psychology and experiences, we know that uh, was inspired by his reading of Buddhism, his understanding of Buddhism. That, that, that is for sure. And particularly uh, uh, the, 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 the doctrine of the Alaya you know, uh, one may speak of two forms of Alaya Vichyana, the individual and the collective. So all psychological problems, all human experiences must be fully totalistically understood in a complete perspective of not only of the individual and in fact not only of his own just particular one life lifetime but in terms of 
द कलेक्टिव अनकॉन्शियस वो महायाना कोर्स इत कलेक्टिव आदम जाना और अदर टर्म्स एंड इनफैक्ट द आइडिया ऑफ अ कलेक्टिव कामा इज नॉट टू बी फाउंड इन अर्ली बुद्धिज्म नॉट इन द पार्टी टेक्स्ट बट द वर द टर्म इज नॉट बट देन द इम्प्लिकेशन सो देन यू कैन से यू कैन आर्ग्यू दैट इट्स देयर बिकॉज़ वी ऑल इन्फ्लुएंस बाय द कंट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ यू नो कंडीशंस ऑफ ह्यूमैनिटी of 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 the whole collective existence so it's something that and more more than that as i just said we have to understand in terms of the sansaric condition sansaric perspective all this you cannot find in early in modern psychology of philosophy so even if we will try to understand that the buddha's karma doctrine we have to bear this in mind So uh, as a seven so understood this uh, you realize how a person can to be determined in this particular space and time why he reacts like that why his behavior is like that so we can accept the person as he is or as she is without prejudices you see and uh, that is very very important for uh, social understanding a lot of problem can be solved if we realize that you know a large part of him is from his not only uh whole you know lifelong experiences and conditioning but going back to you know uh, from buddhist perspective going back to his sansaric existence life after life different experiences we all have different experiences and what is more there is a contribution from the collective karma collective unconscious once we have brought in our perspective like this then i think we human can live a happier life and uh, we can accept one another you know more readily and with more understanding and uh, sympathy and compassion and uh, even also less than ego and think we are better these people are ignorant you know they deserve it you know, people say like that in the, in the west or those who people are western i we shouldn't think like that we all have our problems no, no one is superior to another in in that but in that sense you know because uh, we are made differently if you like we are conditioned differently go from our uh, collective karma as well as personal karma and also from this life since childhood but go back to our previous lives as well is very very important Uh, understanding <coughs> okay so uh one of the points i uh, illustrated in in the in regard to uh, the uh, middle way principle of the early doctrine of karma is that uh, as i said it is not absolutely deterministic not absolutely fatalistic although there is that is expect a bit and uh, many things can be changed you know so that is why there is this uh, uh, emphasis this doctrine that we have to learn to repent we have to learn to chung man kong cham fu ya we have to learn to uh, you know feel honesty within ourselves and say yes if i want to change you know If I'm not kind, I have to change to be kind. I have, let me do something, something I can do. Kindness is something you can practice, for example. So if you will practice acts of kindness. You actually, in a very significant sense, you can counteract your 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 evil karma of unkindness or cruelty, whether in this life or in previous life, etc., etc. You see. Uh, so there's hope for humanity. There's hope for mutual understanding. Mm. Now, in that context, I uh, um, cited one Pali Sutta. That's called the Lona Pala Sutta, and there is a Chinese translation. But uh, unfortunately, the Chinese translation is not good. Uh, it's a bit confusing. And uh, the Pali is clear. 
The owner means sought. You see? Pala though has the same spelling as Pala meaning fruit. Here it doesn't mean fruit. So you remember that. I've seen all kinds of strange uh, English uh, discussion of it. This Pala is uh, linguistically is a variant of Patra. P-H-A, you know, several T and then A. Uh, which you can say is like a, like a, like a crystal uh, of, uh, in this case, Lona. A salt crystal, salt grain. That should be the correct translation. Uh, I quickly look at uh, online <laughs> because I don't have any, I don't have much uh, material with me. I just prepare my lecture actually after going there. Uh, I brought along a few books and a couple of things to read, and I, I just couldn't have time even to go through most of them. But I, I did uh, make use of some of the material and ref refresh my memory because I gave uh, this kind of lectures on karma, the whole series of karma in Sri Lanka also, that was more than 25 years ago, 30 years ago. But it was a long, long time ago. And I couldn't find my own notes, I was trying to find it. But I couldn't find it. Because those notes were actually, they were uh, taken down and uh, I think transcribed by one of my former students. I used to have a copy, but I couldn't find it. Anyway, uh, so I quickly online, I just want to see uh, these Chinese people understanding this. And uh, I saw, for instance, one, uh, one uh, person, a Buddhist, uh, who is very actively, uh, you know, uh, translating sutta, putting up things on the web and on Chinese and Pali man. Uh, I, I don't need to mention his name. I think, uh, in a way, it's very praiseworthy. But some of his uh, understanding and uh, and rendering is uh, quite questionable. And then I just point this out so that you. You read them with some discretion. I think you can certainly benefit from him and from others like that. But then you have to bear in mind that their understanding of Pali and early Buddhism is quite imperfect. So we have a lot to contribute. You people have a lot to contribute. You see, and uh, you know, in some version you have like Kapala, and Kapala means a kind of a, a pot, and then the translation Chinese is a pot of a pan of pen of salt. It doesn't mean that. It means salt grain. You see? So it's very misleading when you read translation in Chinese like this, if you don't know the Pali. Anyway, um, this, this sutta uh, is used by the Buddha to show that uh, you know, nothing is absolutely fixed uh, in, the, in, in, in the retribution of karma. Huh? Uh, although there is a, a pattern, you know, a tendency uh, based on the karmic principle, uh, principle of uh, causes and effects, uh, principle of karma, if you like, you can say. Uh, effects are governed by that principle, but then it's not in a, in a fatalistic way. It's very, very interesting. Uh, so to, so, uh, now the Buddhas start by saying, by, by comparing two statements, you see. Uh, one statement says that in according with uh, the, the karma that a person does, in that manner he receives the vipaka, the retribution, in accordance with the karma that a person does, he experiences or he receives, he experiences that karma. So the Buddha said that if anyone makes a statement like this, what does it mean? It's very interesting. This is the way uh, to show the you know, outstanding uh, manner of the Buddha as a teacher also. It means, the Buddha says, it means that uh, the ideal of uh, the spirit life is useless, is in vain, you know. Uh, and uh, actually it means that there, there is no hope of, uh, of, of, of liberation. 
you might even extend to say there's no hope of attaining enlightenment. If that is the case, so serious. Why is that? Because if we do a karma, uh, any karma, you see, and then we definitely experience the corresponding effect, then it is total determination. You see, if karma totally, absolutely determines our experiences, you know, and uh, we can't avoid it, then if we, if we have done evil karma in the past, then in this life we can't change. We have to receive for the evil. Some can be so strong that you'll be totally stuck there. Supposing you have created karma in the past, you have, you have committed karma in the past that will lead you to hell, it definitely will go to hell. <laughs> uh, so then, what's the meaning of uh, struggling to do good? That's what a spiritual ideal is. So the Buddha said then you, that the whole concept of brahmacharya vasa, the, 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 the living of a spiritual life, fan hang jia, is meaningless, it's not possible. Huh? And uh, therefore, the attainment of a liberation is also not possible. It's so serious, if you think like that. In fact, uh, you can even interpret it to mean that uh, he is having in mind some deterministic doctrine of karma in his time. Then he said, on the other hand, if someone say, uh, yatha 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 vedaniyam ayam puriso kamam karoti tata tata asa vipakam padisangve diyati I have to use a party because it's a little bit complicated and uh, the Chinese translation is so bad. Huh? So that means yatha yatha vedaniyam means in whichever manner to be experienced a karma is that pers a person, this person does a karma like that he experiences the effect of it, the retribution vipakam, retribution of it, asa vipakam, you see in the corresponding manner if you stay like that, that's fine. That allows for hope, that allows for the possibility of the spiritual life, allows for the possibility, the ideal of religion, of moral struggle, of emancipation. Let's think more carefully about this letter, uh, variant of the statement that Buddha said, it's fine, it's okay. Can you understand it? Is it in contrast to the first movement, uh, statement, first statement says that a person does a karma, then he experiences a karma correspondingly, full stop. No? That is determinism. But the second statement says that uh, a karma is, uh, is, um, is retributable in a particular way, right? Vedaniya. Mm? It uh, is to be to be experienced in a particular way, right? So if a person does a karma, any karma, a particular karma has, according to the law of karma, a corresponding effect, right? So when he experiences the effect, he experiences correspondingly. But so second statement doesn't say that he, he categorically will experience it in that way, but it's to be experienced. When he, in other words, when he does experience it, he, he has experienced it, in fact, because every karma has a particular retribution, right? Understand? But he doesn't, first of all, he doesn't necessarily experience it uh, in an absolute totalistic manner. Okay, now then Buddha, it still doesn't sound very clear maybe to you. So the Buddha goes on to give a simile. In that simile, uh, it will become clear. What I just said will become clear. Supposing uh, 
you have some grain of salt. Okay? Now, what is the relatively real uh, effect of salt? Saltiness, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's salt, you put it in water, if you have, that is your action, right? Then the effect is that you have saltiness in the water. The water becomes salty. That is the Vedaniyam part of it, right? Okay, but supposing you put that uh, grain of salt, that crystal of salt, or that, 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 that pinch of salt in a cup of water, right? That saltiness is the result. And when you drink the, that, that, that cup of water, you become very salty. The saltiness becomes very powerful, very obvious. Kayati in that uh, it shows up clearly yeah, in the Pali then. But supposing you have the same amount of salt, same grain of salt, now you put it in a river, river Ganga in the example, right? And then you so what happens to the, the effect of the salt? Doesn't mean there's no, no, no effect. There is. You can't escape the effect. Salt gives saltiness in water. That's the effect. That's why it's Vedanya, it's to be experienced, right? In a particular way. There is saltiness to be experienced in a particular way. But when, you, when a person scoops up water from that river and drink it, it's not to say that he doesn't have the effect. But he doesn't experience in the same fixed way. He will experience the effect as if almost it is plain water because it's so diluted. So the effect doesn't uh, uh, doesn't overcome him, overwhelm him. The effect is there. So there is a corresponding thing. So a uh, karma has uh, has a uh, effect that is very near to be to be retributed, to be experienced in a particular way, yata yata. Tathata, in that way, he experiences it, but it's not, first of all, it's actually, according to Buddhism, it's not necessarily that he experiences it. Well, example is also given, for instance, and he says, uh, supposing, okay, then he goes on to give an actual example of karma, no? after giving the simile of the sort. Now, here is again another observation about the Buddha as a teacher. He always, where, you know, where, when it comes to something very subtle, very difficult to explain conceptually, he gives a simile. Because often a simile, an illustration, tells you something directly to, if you like, to your consciousness or to your unconscious. Uh, in a manner that conceptual explanation cannot do it properly. Just now when I give you the statements, even if I translate literally, it doesn't give the full impact on your mind. But when you when you when you uh, hear the, the simile of the salt, then it becomes clear. So very often the Buddha as literature gives similes. That is a characteristic feature of the Buddha as a teacher. And sometimes uh, this way is very, very important in religious teaching. Now, l let me say, like, have a little bit of digression here. In fact, uh, this is the way that uh, many teachers in ancient time, in the Abhidhamma period also, uh, uh, they were inspired by the Buddha thing. They, those who, those who uh, uh, value the authority of the sutras, you know, uh, they follow the Buddha example. They give examples. They give similes. So there's a group of uh, of preachers called the Darshantikas. Uh, uh, there are people who explain very profound doctrines, uh, for instance, karma doctrine and so on. Yeah? You know, karma doctrine is one of the most profound doctrine. It sounds like just a few words can explain it, but it's so difficult. Why it has to be like that? You know. It, exactly in, the, in what manner a particular karma is actually leads to a particular result, you see? And then how we can uh, lessen it, we can even uh, sometimes uh, 
transcend it, not to say avoid it. You see, uh, things are actually extremely complicated. We can't pretend that we fully understand this uh, in terms of conceptual explanation. But we 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 can often intuit it. We can understand what the Buddha is trying to say, particularly particularly through a simile. So in ancient times, these Dharastandika masters, they went about explaining profound teachings, not just philosophical, as a philosopher. They always give examples, similes. And these examples are examples in the world. That's, that's the point. See, uh, you know, salt put in water and the Ganga River. These are, you know, these are things that people experience in India, or even today. So, so you can relate to the audience by using examples in daily life. That's very important. It's not that. They are not ex abstract examples. And that is a very important aspect. So coming back to that, uh, that story in the Sutta, then the Buddha explains. After giving the simile first, then the Buddha explains. You know? So it's like this, he says, supposing someone does uh, an evil karma, a kusala, unwholesome karma. In fact, uh, it may not be actually a very severe one, but it could be. at least say be strong enough to lead the person, let's say, to be born in hell. Now, some some people who are actually having committed such a karma will actually go to hell. What kind of people? People who have not cultivated their behavior, their body, their speech, their mind, particularly mental cultivation. You see? Their chitta, right? mental cultivation, and their pamya. These words are especially important. That's why I said the only hope is in meditation. Because only in meditation that you gain true transformation. Understanding and intellectual lectures and discussion and arguments can help you only to some extent, in fact not to a very large extent. So what? You can understand, you can preach, you can write books, you can produce PhDs, you know, <laughs> you can be a bestseller. But you can't even change yourself. That's what happened to many psychologists, counselors and uh, psychotherapists, you know. They have a lot of interesting theories, but they don't. They can't. They, they themselves are the have the most serious problems. You see, sometimes they mess up the patient in the relationship because they have not transformed themselves. Buddhism is very different. It tells you a problem, but you must gain insight. How to gain insight? Insight is not knowledge uh, in the sense of book knowledge. Insight means your consciousness must be transformed, and to transform your consciousness, to gain insight in the true sense, you must meditate because it's only through meditation that you come to higher levels of human uh, awareness, of human human experiences, higher domains, if you like, of humanity. If you don't believe me, you must try meditation and you will understand what we are saying. Uh, so it's not a matter of scholarship. So come back to that. So uh, the Buddha says, supposing someone who does not cultivate his body, you know, and uh, his thoughts, and particularly his mind, his panya, the word comes out, uh, and also other factors. Supposing that person is short-lived. Now here is a karmic factor from his past life. According to Buddhism, for example, if you have, if you kill, the corresponding effect is to be short-lived. You don't have to bring in an external God to explain it. That's why I said that uh, this principle, this 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 uh, this premise that there is no God is very important to understand the Buddha's uh, special feature of his teaching. In this case, we are talking about karma. You know? So supposing the person happens to be a short-lived person, that hap that's true, you know, you must say, oh, because of my health, because of my uh, genes, you know, but then how do you come to 
this kind of hell and this kind of jinn also is partly karmically turning in also. Yeah? So you can't even understand even from just a genetic uh, aspect. Uh, well, that's important. Yeah? Uh, your physiological effect, your, your medical aspect. It goes far, you know, m much more deeply than that. Only Buddhism can offer you this full perspective. That's why it's such a wonderful religion. It makes sense. And things that you can't explain. Why I care about this, care about this, like that, and you know, my living, and then still I get sick, still I get cancer, still I get heart attack. People say, why me, why me? <laughs> so, you can't answer those questions often, you see. So, uh, in Buddhism, you have an answer. You have to think of the samsaric perspective, it's perspective of your past life, you see. And then in your past life, you have done many, many different kinds of acts, different kind of karma, and they all have corresponding effects. But whether you experience them or not in this life, Huh? Or how you experience it, then of course these things are not fully determined. There is a that general principle of determination, but but the the effect do not have to unfold in that fixed deterministic manner. That's a very, very important principle. Yeah? So coming with that that kind of person. Supposing it's short lived, what does it mean? Think about it. So a person doesn't do meditation, doesn't have uh, kindness, doesn't practice kindness, right? And doesn't do med uh, uh, doesn't understand the, 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 the Buddha's teaching, uh, no sincerity and so on and so on. On top of that, he lives a short life. It means even if he, towards the end, he realizes he must do good and he must practice meditation, he has no time, right? <laughs> He can't compensate for it. He doesn't have a chance. He doesn't have the space. Or more correctly, he doesn't have the time to do something to counteract it. So, when he dies, the, 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 the tendency, the, the, the force of karma is such that he will be led to rebirth in hell. On the other hand, Supposing a person, having done exactly the same evil act, but he repents, he changes his mind, right? So this dependent thing is not, again, not an intellectual thing. It involves a heart, your feeling, a whole being, your whole volition. Oh, I really feel sorry, why I, am, why I behave like that, why am I like that, you know? Why I'm so cruel, why I kill, or why I hate it. Uh, why I uh, draw, mm, etc. Very sincerely you repent. Repentance must be sincere. So you do repentance, every, confession of fault, repentance, every Sunday here. And uh, more, moreover, more importantly, he cultivates ethically, he, he particularly cultivates his mind, he cultivates his panya, his tutor. Sau sam sau wai. Okay, this was in both in Chinese and in Pali also, in both versions. Plus, supposing a person uh, uh, karma is such that he can live a long life, he had plenty of chance to, plenty of time to cultivate, to change. So everything added together. Right? And he will experience that effect in this very life he, be, without having to wait for him to be dead and then without any choice, you know, uh, going to hell straight. No, not like that. He experienced this life in a very light way, just in the, in the manner that uh, the person who puts the same amount of salt in the river water. Not that he doesn't experience it, he will experience it in such a light way that the effect is not even visible. Can you follow? Mm. Hmm? So, uh, for instance, uh, the effect, uh, it definitely has an effect, but the effect may make him say, sick for, for a few months, 
I had a minor operation or something like that. You see? But he can he can survive it. And that is finished. That's done. So that even if he at the, uh, when, when, when he finishes his life at the 100th year, when he lived 100 years old, he dies. Other, other karmas, you know, will, uh, will be ready, but not that particular evil karma. So that, that, that industry shows clearly that karma is not absolutely deterministic. A lot of things can be done. And you can, you can counteract. This is the Buddha's teaching, uh, not my teaching. Hmm? Uh, not my. I I I I have not interpreted it in any way outside the, the, the sutta. So Buddhism gives you hope actually, but at the same time, acknowledging that everything follows the, the certain principles. Karma is a law. So we have our past conditioning. We suffer, and uh, we experience think in ways that we perhaps prefer not to explain in that way, but they cannot help them. But uh, they may not uh, touch us so badly. For some people, they have to feel like they want to commit suicide or they want to destroy themselves and others. For you, if you understand it and you cultivate, you are transforming yourself, then they come, they pass, and uh, you go through that. And then you come to, you go to the next life. But in the meantime, you have done a lot of good. You have created a good karma. So uh, I think that is a very inspiring teaching, and uh, it's not an abstract teaching. It's something that we can relate to our life, to our understanding. You see, and um, it gives a conviction, you know, in the Buddha's teaching as a guide for our existence. It's not just a matter of book knowledge, not a matter of philosophy. That is why I don't like people who label Buddhism as a philosophy, trying to escape that, uh, you know, the, the label of religion. I think so far the word religion is still the best. That certainly the connotation of religion has to be modified. Eh? And uh, you know, for instance, the concept of God and notion and so on you know, must be excluded for for religion like Buddhism. But uh, it goes far beyond just intellectual knowledge, just philosophy, just you know, understanding your brain. It goes to your heart, your whole being, the depth of your feeling, the depth of your consciousness. It brings you back to the whole uh, perspective of Sarah. Now about this, I might like to add just one or two more words. There are some modern Buddhist scholars uh, who said that, well, you know, I'm a Buddhist, definitely I profess to be Buddhist, but I don't believe in, uh, I don't have to believe in rebirth. Can it be like that? It, it is controversial, right? And actually, there was uh, the Indian leader, Dr. Mbeka also, uh, he avoided, he, he hinted that he didn't believe in rebirth, but he is a fully committed, strongly committed Buddhist. He led thousands and thousands, lakhs and lakhs, of untouchable Hindus uh, uh, to become Buddhist, and they wrote about Buddhism in a whole movement of, you know, new, 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 new Buddhist. It was started by him. Today is that that the momentum is still going on. You know, you have huge uh, uh, mass uh, ceremony of so-called conversions. You know, unfortunately, uh, they don't have no guidance. You know. And perhaps uh, that kind of condition without guidance and understanding may not be a very positive one, a uh, healthy one, but still, I, for one, credit respect him. But he, he, he was one of those who didn't like to admit that the Buddha thought about the rebirth. But I must say that for all these years of my reading of the suttas and understanding, everywhere in every sutta, the Buddha speaks about samsara and lives, you know. Even if we allow for some so-called uh, texture layers that have been uh, 
uh, maybe modify or add a, bit, a slightly later time. Eh? They can't be so late, and uh, but you can't you can you can't avoid that. You know uh, that in in fact the Buddha very very strongly, very uh, in a committed manner, spoke of the samsara existence. You know uh, he, he said that uh, for ex for example in his uh, when he described his own in a other private manner in his own struggle for enlightenment. What happened? He meditated. This is one thing. You know, the part of leading to insight is involve necessary meditation. And then when it comes for him, not necessary for everybody, but for him, at least in his life, one thing stands out in his meditative uh, own training, own experience, is that the fourth dhyana, the fourth jhana, uh, seems to be central, very important. You see? And uh, on the basis of the fourth jhana, he developed insights. You see? And he developed insight. Now, even psychology says, if you want to change yourself, you must have insight. Someone tell you, oh, it's like that, you have that experience, is that experience is uh, affecting you, at, uh, you know, adversely. If you're just told like that, you say, yeah, maybe you will never change. But when you in inwardly gain insight deeply and fully convinced that this is the case and uh, you know now I know it you know truly then you will change when you read the Buddha's teaching I say I was saying that uh, his autobiographic uh, account uh, he he explained how he struggled and then, the, for instance, in one sutta, he actually now he overcome his fear in the forest and he lived a, a simple life in the forest, detachment. All these things are also very important uh, factors, you know, for, for, for transforming yourself. Hmm? And then the, another very, very important uh, feature in this, uh, this part is that he meditated systematically and he gained Jhana, from Jhana he gained insight, that was the word <laughs> that led me to the digression, is it? And then he was fully liberated. So now, what are these insights that he gained? Very important. There are three, four insights. This insight again is no more just uh, intellectual knowledge, you know? The three vijja, and three insight. What is that? First one is the knowledge or insight into the past lives. So he comes to a stage after developing his fourth jhana, and it's fully his personality is fully integrated. You know, he he, he, he as it were, he, he, he was able to as, assess that the very depth of his consciousness, you know, and uh, from the very root of his consciousness, he was able to transform it, huh? as it were. And uh, he could see in very, very concrete way, you see, all his past lives, his living a certain life and then dying and then reborn, you know, and uh, he was a particular, in, in a particular clan, or family, or a particular span of life, or a particular name, you know, caste, so on, so on, you know, all the details all appear in, in his mind clearly. It's an insight. They're not, they're not just knowledge. He, he was not being told by another person. The so Buddha never had a teacher as such. He saw in his mind clearly. Now because of that, he was convinced of the past life that we, 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 we arise and we fall. That is your own description, right? 
that's very important. So when you begin to teach, uh, say rebirth, it's not a, as I say, it's not a philosophy, not a speculation. He was teaching from his heart. He was teaching from his own experiences, from his own insight. That's very important. That's what uh, usually, uh, you know, usually uh, scholars uh, in modern time lack. Then they may be good scholars of uh, Buddhist teachings. Then, second insight he gained was the insight into the so-called uh, falling and uh, or disappearance, uh, chuti and upapada means uh, uh, rising. That is, in other words, a uh, dying and re-arising in accordance with karma. This person dies like this because of certain karma. He was born in a particular uh, realm, in a particular form, even he looked ugly, <laughs> he looked uh, beautiful, such a, in certain, uh, certain physics. Now we think, this is what I mean, we think we have certain genes, our parents are tall, so we are tall, parents are strong. Yet yeah, the first thing is, how you, your concept goes into a womb of that parent a connection with that family. All this has some karmic connection, you see. Why you become a Chinese, for instance? Well, because I'm Chinese, I react like this. Because I'm a European, I react like that. Yeah, but then the fact that you, you, you know, you happen to be born in, among the Chinese and not, not among the European, that also has a karmic part of it. If you miss out this factor, these are the factors that are missing in the equations, then you can't get a full solution whether in philosophy or whether in psychotherapy. Yeah? So, right, in the second, second, in the second um, watch of the night, uh, in, 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 uh, in the attainment of the second uh, insight, second knowledge, he was able to see the working of karma in full details, and then he realized that not only he died and was reborn, but all being he was able to see. Satana, uh, all the, of all of certain beings, eh? rising and falling, uh, falling according to karma. And they're talking about that just now. Only then, because of certain karma, a certain person was born in that certain type of family, and he 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 he, he has a beautiful feature. Another person is born in another family, he has an ugly feature, and so on and so on. Eh? Where you should. Usually people will think these are accidents and all these things. No, these are actually had to do with your karma, not only your individual karma, but your collective karma also. Huh? Has to do with your samsaic perspective. So in, in the Buddhist picture, in the Buddhist explanation, things are so thorough, you know, so uh, totalistic in perspective. Huh? So uh, he saw this clearly. That's okay. Then you, that means he witnessed, he saw the fact of samsara and rebirth clearly, and his, he witnessed and saw the effect personally of the working of karma. Huh? And the third one, the, in the third watch, that was at the time he gained full liberation gain the third knowledge. What is the third knowledge? Third knowledge is said to be the knowledge of the exhaustion of his asava. Asava means the outflows and you can understand generally to mean that the defilements, all the impurities were purged, right? No more, right? He needed that to fully experience and be convinced that now I am liberated. I'm truly liberated. And I truly have transcended birth and death. So therefore, you know, at the end of uh, the this process, we see usually a stock uh, description of anybody becoming an arhan, including the Buddha himself. You know, Kina Jati, you remember, Vishuddham uh, Brahmacharya, Katang Karaniya, and so on. You see, so that means that. Uh, uh, the statement in Chinese also we have that. Mo sang yi zheng, fan hang yi lap, 
，所作皆辦，不受後有啊。So this has no, no, it's not a, not a book knowledge, not a philosophy now, not a doctrine even. That's why the Dhamma is beyond doctrine out, out in. Not a speculation, but an insight, a personal insight, and a full insight that is clearly says, "My birth is entered, right, and uh, I have no more further coming back." All these are clear statements of his conviction, of his understanding that. Otherwise, you have the coming and going, like he saw in the first two, through the first two uh, visions, through the first two knowledges. So you put all these things clearly together. It's very difficult to rationalize and try to be a scientific person and to be respectable in the modern world and say, "I'm a Buddhist, but I don't have to believe in uh, uh, that the Buddha taught uh, rebirth and, and, and the past life." I think it's very difficult to justify that. If you look, I I just give me only one or two examples. But if you look at the, all the suttas, you know, you realize that the Buddha is talking about the samsaric, and he even assumed that the samsaric existence. Eh? For instance, another just another very quick one is uh, in the Brahmajala Sutta. The Buddha said that uh, some uh, uh, some of the Brahmins, you know, they 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 they. Come to hold certain views, whether it's a view of annihilation, whether it's a view of eternalism, and so on. You see, uh, because of uh, not just because speculation. You think, oh, it's all speculations. You have this speculation of annihilation, is yes, speculation of uh, eternalism, is yes, speculation that the world is finite, the world is infinite. But. He was talking about all the religious traditional the samana bhavanas, and they actually meditated. So even meditation is not enough. They meditated and they even gained insight. The Buddha said that uh, you know, supposing some uh, meditators were very successful to a large extent in the meditation, and they 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 see you know being. Uh, passing away and and, uh, and re-arising up to a certain extent, they see oh, there's no more after that, because in the ins the inside is not perfect, not high enough, you like, not exhaustive enough, so they come to conclusion that there's an end, for example, and so on. You see, so all the insight also can mislead you, so. It doesn't mean that when you have this insight, uh, spiritual insight, in spiritual attainment, uh, you know, uh, it's enough for you to 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 see reality truly. So the Buddha says, uh, what they have seen, what insight they have, I already had, but I have gone further than that. In Buddha's time, I gone further than that. So in the point is, in the, all these descriptions, clearly the Buddha was talking about these samana brahmanas, you know, actually seeing past lives, even though, albeit, not comprehensively enough, not thoroughly enough, but they have experienced. Yes. The Buddha accepted that. That yes, yes, they have. They have seen they have insight into the basic past life and passing on the samsara part of it, but then accept that they come to some level and he he couldn't that person couldn't go further. Then he he form a conclusion accordingly. And so, uh, so uh, there are a lot of things to be learned from the Buddha's teaching of uh, karma and. Uh, when we try to understand in details, we realize that many things we can apply it to us. It's not just an abstract teaching. Even in terms of uh, our living, in terms of understanding of psychology, 
you know, in terms of understanding of human nature, in terms of how one must transform one mind, you see, and not only just a partial transformation but a complete transformation through meditation, all these things become very clear when we examine a doctrine like this. Okay, I think that's enough for today.